good against all odds the word is going to come forth so while we're still standing as we like to give reverence to the word of God I would like to read again that verse of scripture from last week and from a couple of weeks ago that my wife just reminded us of and before we get into the reading of that I just want to say to you all that there is a release of joy and when I'm saying joy I'm talking about supernatural joy over us in this meeting because God knows that we need that joy out there and the Bible says in the presence of God there is fullness of joy when people give you grief they are doing their job okay Jesus told us he says in the world you have tribulations and trials he says but in me you have peace so don't let's get too fixated on what people are dishing out and forget what God has abundantly available in his presence so this is the moment to shift gear into God's presence and all of what God has to offer but the verse of scripture in particular is Psalms 103 verse 7 and so let's just read it together one more time as it is our custom we like reading even if it's one or two verses while we're standing up um, and this is the one we're reading today Psalms 103 verse 7 now let me ask again by show of hands if there are people in here that have been meditating on Psalms 101. Okay, that's a test. 103. Laura was like, gotcha. <laughs> Psalms 103 verse 7. Oh, that's good. That is good. All right, we're just going to read it one more time and then we can be seated. So what does it say? Psalms 103 verse 7. It says, he made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. I don't know about you, but I want to know his ways. And because you can't just find God's ways. He says, my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. So the only way to know his ways is if he shows it to you. The Bible says, the Bible did not say Moses stumbled on his way. The Bible says God showed him. And so the secret to really finding God's way is having him show it to you. And the way to get God to show it to you is also as simple and clear from the word of God. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3, God said to Jeremiah, because Jeremiah was there trying to guess his way through. God had shown certain things to him. He had no clue what he was looking at. And God knew that he didn't know. And he was ready to continue to guess and to guess and to gamble. And God just said to him, he says, Jeremiah, just ask of me and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come boldly once again today before your throne of grace, where we get to obtain mercy and grace to help in times of need. Father, we have come to such times wherein we have need for your joy, need for your peace, not the kind of peace that the world gives. You know, the world kind of peace is peace, quote unquote, where there is nothing happening. But your kind of peace is one that allows for us to be able to sleep and rest in you even in the midst of the storm. We want that kind of peace. We know you have that kind of peace for us. And as we come into your presence today, we want to soak in that peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, your word is coming forth and it is, and as it is your custom, your word will do us good in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Please let's be seated. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. So I'm excited to share with you some of the things that the Lord's revealed to me about these Psalms 103 because the reality of it is we know from the experience of the disciples when Jesus was here that there is always more if you would get closer to God. You know, Jesus would talk to thousands of people and he will speak in parables. And then afterwards, even sometimes when the disciples would have concluded within themselves that they know exactly what he said, he would ask them, do you really know what I said? And every now and again, they'll 
do what they typically do. They'll guess and spit out their assumptions and then he will pull them even closer and tell them deeper things. It will reveal to them more of the meaning of what he has said. So when God started us on this journey of intimacy and by, by the journey of intimacy, what I'm referring to is that in the last couple of weeks, God's been inviting us to come closer. He's been saying, don't just stand from a distance wherein you can see the train of my robe. I want you to come closer so that you can experience the robe of my train. Because remember the woman with the issue of blood, she had a relationship with the robe of Jesus. She stood there and she said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment. She didn't say, well, I can see he's here somewhere. Maybe I can just, you know, assume that I'm going to be okay. She said, no, I need to get close enough. And she pushed and pushed and pushed until she had that contact with the robe of his garment. And so the robe of his train is, is, is kind of like a metaphor with which we are being invited to come closer to be in intimacy with God. You see, I was reading somewhere recently about the way God made everything. You know the fish in the sea. When God made the fish in the sea, God did not say fish appear. No, he spoke to the sea and he says, now bring forth an abundance of fish. When he was going to make the trees, he didn't say, okay, let, we, let us have some things that can hold leaves and hold fruits. No, he spoke to the earth and he says, earth, bring forth trees that will produce fruits that will carry seed after their kind. But when it was time to make man, what did he do? He spoke to himself. That was why he says, now let us make man. You see, the thing is, God will make things out of what will sustain them. So that the relationship between the living and life is not hidden, neither is it complicated. Because the fish cannot live outside of the water. The tree cannot survive outside of the ground. And so man, human beings were not designed by God to survive outside of God. And so when he's calling you into intimacy, it's because he recognizes that you have been too disconnected from the source of life. And so God is inviting us to come closer. He says, I want you to come closer because I have more to give to you. You see, when a tree is growing up or a plant is in the process of becoming a tree, his, its roots are usually on the surface, not more than a few inches into the ground. But then in order for that tree to be able to, or that plant to become a tree, it needs to keep going down deeper and deeper into the source. Into the source. And so God is saying, I want you to come closer so that you can get deeper. Not because of what you will give to me, but it's because of what I am ready to give to you. Let me say this folks, the earth is fine by itself without trees before God made trees the earth was there the earth was there even before the waters came that's why the waters are on top and then the land was beneath when Solomon was interacting with the wisdom of God she said that she was possessed first even before the Lord God made the primal dust of the earth the dust is the primal element of creation and so the dust of the earth has always been there. God has always been there. He doesn't need us. We are the ones that need him. If you find a way to remove all the fish in the sea, the sea will still roar. The sea will still be the sea. So here is the deal. Many of us approach God when it comes to fulfilling the things that he has commanded with a sense of, oh man, we have to do this because God says so. Almost as if when we do it, we do it for God. When God says, love your neighbor as yourself, it's not because if you don't love your neighbor, God will fall off his throne. 
But God knows that the way he has designed the human existence is such that your life is better when you are at peace with your neighbor. Let me tell you something. Sometimes I'm driving through some neighborhoods and I see people when they're cutting their grass, they make sure that they don't go beyond that line because they don't want to upset their neighbor. And in some cases, it's just because they're lazy and they can't be asked to help somebody else out. But I am thankful to God that the kind of neighbor that I have, when he's cutting his grass and he gets to where mine is, he cuts it too. But he wouldn't do that if he thought to himself or if he thinks of me as a beast who would come out and be roaring like a lion. He knew that I would send him a text. I would make him coffee. I would ask after him because I know that being at peace with my neighbor is the will of God and it has dividends. When God says love your neighbor as yourself, it's because God knows that your neighbor is human and one day they will offend you. And if you don't love them enough, guess what? You will not be able to put up with them. The Bible says love bears all things. I see many parents in the room and you know that your children do stuff to you that you, you, you don't even have to forgive them. You just don't get offended because they're your children. If your neighbor were to do half of that, you're calling the cops. You know, if your neighbor were to do half of that, imagine if your neighbor just walks into your kitchen and grabs that mug, your favorite mug with which you have coffee in the morning and tosses it off the counter and then it breaks and then it says, so what are you going to do? Oh, you would do a lot. You would get a lawyer. After calling the police, you would do a lot. But when your child does it, you're like, oh, that is so silly. He just broke mommy's little mug. And sometimes maybe they get a little smack, but that's it. By dinner time, you feed them. Your phone doesn't ring, you don't call the police. That is because the love you have for them is unconditional, regardless of what they do. And God is like, if you can love your neighbor like that, you have immune to your heart against the frustration of the foolishness that they may someday do. And it's not just your neighbor that will do foolish things. Even you sometimes, you will unknowingly. I say unknowingly because everybody here, we're so perfect. For us to do something silly, it would have to be an accident. You understand what I mean? Well, you were not supposed to agree, but you did. So come on now. We may have to pray the prayer of humility. You see what I mean? So I just want to encourage you one more time because God is asking us to do things that are primarily beneficial to us. He is not growing. God is already the fullness of all of what he will ever be. The Bible says in Colossians that Christ Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You know, the significance of what God said there by the Holy Spirit is very huge. He said Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what that is letting us know is that even the body of Christ that is still being formed is already, con is already a, a representation of the fullness of God. So we think we're growing. Yes, we are growing individually as believers. We are coming together in unity as the body of Christ. But regardless of what we do or what we don't do, God is already saying that I am complete. The Almighty God is complete. He is the fullness of all things. And so whatever he's asking you to do is not to make him any better than he is. God never gets better. Because for a thing to get better means there is a comparison. There is progress. There is development. God is not making progress. God is already God. He's already all of what he's going to be. He's already done all of what he's going to do. And so just think about it, that why would he come after us again and again with this instruction and that instruction, if not for our own benefit? The Bible says that God gave us the scripture that we may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So having that understanding should make it more of a fun thing to do, to go after the Lord with all of what you have. Whenever God says to do a thing, David says, in the morning I will arise and I will seek his face even in the quiet of the morning. And that is because he knew that when God would come to Adam and Eve, God will come in the cool of the evening. Now, 
you're saying wait a minute brother Moses David is saying morning God is saying evening yeah because God's day starts in the evening okay your day starts in the morning but his day starts in the evening and so David is like if he cares enough about us to come at the beginning of his day before anybody else gets to occupy God's attention like the angels or anything else in the cosmos he will come to the man David recognized that as the man who actually need that God I need to go to him at the beginning of my day too before I get occupied that is the perspective that we need to have when it comes to pursuing God, when it comes to seeking His face. Now, I would say this as a caveat, because I know, and my wife actually mentioned it, the majority of people seeking God today are seeking God for selfish reasons. And when I say selfish reasons, I'm not talking about the fact that you want to grow in Him, that you want to find His peace. Many people are seeking God for God to come as a genie to give them things that the world say that they need. Let me say that again very slowly. You know, last night we were having a prayer meeting instead of having the question and answer that we normally have because my wife wasn't available. That was the reason, but eventually we knew that God had something already in mind. So she said, why don't you go out there and pray? I said, well, good idea, because I was planning to do that on Monday anyway, so I'm going to just do it now. And we asked for prayer requests. And the first prayer request came from Franca in the UK. And she said, I would love to stop sleeping when God is asking me to pray. That really touched my heart. You see, because that was the same prayer point that the Holy Spirit gave to me as I was getting ready for that meeting. That we need to start to rebuke renounce and resist whatever gets in the way of us praying in this season. But what really touched my heart was the fact that she wasn't asking for something material. She wasn't asking for something that is going to benefit the flesh over the spirit. You see, when we seek the things of the spirit and the things of the kingdom, everything else that your flesh needs will come. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness then all of these things shall be added unto you. He said, but the Gentiles, the unbelievers, you know what they do? They seek those things first. And once they're exhausted from seeking things, then they're like, oh God, I have time for you now. And by that time, God does not have time for you. You see, because God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. He says, seek me while you may find me. Call me while I may be found. So I want to encourage you folks, when we're seeking God, we're not seeking things. We're seeking God genuinely because he has invited us to come closer. So one of the things that we're going to do today, by the grace of God, if I, let, me, let me lend you another verse of scripture. Come with me to Psalms 79. We're going to read Psalm 79. Let's see, I think it's verse 11. Psalm 79. Verse 11, it, what does it say? It says, let the groaning of the prisoner come before you according to the greatness of your power. Preserve those who are appointed to die. The word of God says that even those who are in prison, God is listening. He's listening to their groaning. Now, what about you? Who has the freedom and the liberty to do it without anybody necessarily inconveniencing you? I'm not sure you understand the implication of the fact that God is saying, let even the ones who are in prison, let them grow. The ones who are on death row, the ones who have been appointed to die, God is listening to everybody. And why is he listening? Because he knows that there is no hope outside of him. And so it is not what you seemingly have or what you seem to have that you need. All you need is him. Because in reality, without him, we have nothing. And God is putting himself out there. He says, look, I am all you need. When you feel like a prisoner, unable to accomplish all of the things of your purpose, I am the one that you need. 
when you feel like you're running out of the blessings from the last season and certain things are about to die in your life, a business is about to die, a relationship is about to be strained to death, a marriage is on its last leg, God is saying even though those things appear like that, I am still the one you need. But guess what? Many of us, why we feel in incapacitated, why we feel imprisoned, instead of crying to God and groaning to Him, we are trying to make our own way out of jail. We are trying to break out of it. Rather than letting your heart be secure in the Lord as the glory and the lifter of your head, many of us are trying to be the surgeons of our own destinies. And the Lord is saying, I am all you need. Whatever situation you're in, call upon me and I will answer you. This thing that I'm sharing with you here today, this particular direction that I am taking, was dropped in my heart while the worship was on. Because the Lord showed to me people that are just standing in his presence and they were not opening their mouths. And they said to me, they are not asking. And so if God is asking you to do things, he's asking you to get closer, you should ask him, Lord, what must I do to be even closer? You see, because the beauty of the way God relates with us is that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one who calls you, but then he's also the one that performs what he has called you to do. The Bible says faithful is he who has called who will also do it. And it is important at this particular junction for us to know that simply because to continue to repeat an instruction that God has given is to some people, after a while, it becomes a burden. You just feel, you start feeling guilty. Because man, every time I go to church, every time we have service, we've been reminded of the need to get closer to God, to find the robe of his presence. And I'm not doing it. I keep sleeping. I'm not doing it. I keep, you know, slacking. And then it becomes a burning and it becomes guilt. And I believe that to some of us here, is it may already be that these instructions are calling you out or you feel like you're being called out. So rather than feeling guilty, because guilt does not help anybody, guilt, that feeling of guilt is chains in itself. So what do you do? Just turn it back around and say, Lord, you have asked me to come close. So what must I do? What exactly needs to go? How is this sleep going to be wiped off my face? How is this feeling of lethargy? How is this feeling of drowsiness going to be taken off of me? Ask him and then he will show you. See, because if the Lord is commanding it, he is ready to also equip you to do it. Before we go on to pray, I have two more things on my heart that I want to share with us. As we were praying yesterday, the Lord took us to the book of Psalms again, 118. And I think it's actually good for us to read it. Psalms 118. And we read from verse 3. Now verse 2 says, if I let's, let's start from verse 1. The Bible says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Now, in order for us to fully grasp the implication of what is about to be what I'm about to share is this, we are in a season wherein what we need the most is the mercy of God. That is what we need the most in the season that we're in. Remember the children of Israel, a lot of them lived in fear of the law and by proxy, the judgment of God. Because God says, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. And so all of their thinking was always, I must not break the law. Because when I break the law, what I'm expecting is judgment, right? And so when Jesus came, Jesus could see all of the pain that they were under, that they were going through and all of the burden that they were under. And he wanted to reveal what was in their heart that was bothering them the most. So Jesus would pass a sentence from time to time that made them question if he was truly God. I'll give you an example. There was a woman that was caught in adultery. And they came with stones 
because they said it is the law of Moses. The law that God gave us through the hand of Moses says if a woman is caught in adultery like that, we need to stone her to death. I mean, of course, you know the rest of the story. Jesus wrote in the sand and he said to them, whoever amongst you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Why would Jesus take that approach? Jesus took that approach for many reasons. But one of them is because he knows the fear of judgment that was in their heart. To cast a stone is to execute judgment and even they know that they are unable to stand the judgment of God. So what did they do? Each one of them dropped a stone. They went back home, but they came again another day, still on the same bandwagon of trying to see the judgment of God on other people, whereas they themselves are afraid of that judgment of God. So what did Jesus tell them? Jesus said to them, he says, if you know what it means when it was said that God desires mercy over judgment, you will not castigate the guiltless. Because in their minds, everyone's broken the law. Everyone's guilty. But they don't want to be the first to go. And that is the reason why they kept pointing to other people. As soon as they see somebody else who has committed sin, they're like, there you go. She committed adultery. We need to come after her. Look at the world that we live in today. This world of political correctness. No matter what you say, people will come after you. The same people who come after you themselves are not holy before the Lord. They are not righteous before the Lord. But see, the fear of judgment, basically what it looks like in the realm of the spirit is that people are lining up to be executed for their sins because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But you don't want to be the first in line. So as soon as it's getting close to your turn, you pull the person behind you forward. And that is the reason why people are always accusing other people and judging other people simply because they want to continue to buy time, to buy time, to buy time, to buy time. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You are too fixated on judgment. You should recognize the mercy of God. Because let me tell you something, if we are more conversant or if we are more conscious of the mercy of God over our lives, guess what? We will be more merciful to other people. You see, because what you have is what you give. And so the Bible says here that we need to give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. He says, let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. I'm building up a case for verse 3 because I don't want you to miss it. You see, the times that we're in is the time of the mercy of God. And you know why? Look around you. Immorality is at an all-time high. A lot of craziness is going, in the, going on in the world. And one of the things that we do know is that God has already instructed the earth to keep record of all the foolishness that is going on. And God said to the earth, the moment you cannot take anymore, begin to groan. And the earth is already groaning right now. The earthquakes, the increase in seismic activities that we're seeing is because the earth is sending signal home to say, okay, I am about, I've about had enough. Because the earth speaks to God because there is nothing that God makes that God does not interact with. And I've established that and I've taught you that before, shown you references in scripture. And so here is the deal. We are beginning to see that the earth is about to open up. And the stars of the heavens have also had enough. Because the Bible says, when immorality fills the earth and the cup of the wrath of God is full, what will follow? The stars of the heaven will be shaken off and they will fall to the earth as a fig tree is shaken by the wind. So all of these things are happening. But when they happen, how is any man going to escape? Because when the judgment of God comes, the same God that makes it to rain on the good and the wicked is still the same God of today. And people are like, yeah, yeah, but rain is a good thing. <laughs> but when God describes his judgment, what word does he use? He says, I will rain down my judgment from the heavens as fire. He did that in the time of the children of Israel. 
every single thing that happened to the Israelites, I mean to the, to, the, to the Egyptians, was literally coming from up above. And so when the angel of death also came, he came and he could have killed everybody if not that they found protection in the blood of the Lamb. And that was the mercy of God. What I am saying to you folks is that when the judgment of God comes, the only way to escape it is to find the ark of his mercy. Do you know that when the earth was flooded, if the mercy of God was not required, Noah shouldn't have worried. God would have just created like a, 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 a vortex over his house and it will rain everywhere but not touch him. And God is like, no, that is not how I operate. When it rains, it rains on the good and the wicked. So if the good is going to survive my judgment, they need my mercy. If you are in a nation wherein a handful of people are doing evil things, when their judgment comes, it will come upon the entire nation. Now, let me, no, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this very clearly. Simply because many of us don't think like that anymore. We have become so individualized in our thinking that we just think, well, the moment I do what I'm supposed to do, it's on the rest of those guys. I'm not going to suffer from, for anybody's sin. But the Bible says that when the wicked has been punished, the righteous share in their punishment. You see what I mean? And so in order for you not to suffer for what people are doing in the world today and what they have been doing for quite some time, you need the mercy of God. You see, last night, in fact for like two nights now, I have been awoken in the middle of the night over this issue of the mercy of God. It's like I'm hearing chants of mercy, saying we need mercy. Those of you that were on the call yesterday, what did we pray about? After praying against the spirit of, of sleep and tiredness that is not letting people pray, we went in as the house of Aaron to cry for mercy. It is not a joking matter because let me tell you something. Was it not Jacob who left his father's, who left the house of his father-in-law? And he took nothing but the profit that he had made legitimately from doing business. But one of his wives, his second wife, Rachel, she took something from the man's house and that brought judgment over everybody. And it happened several times in the Bible that one man, let me tell you something, why did Jesus have to come? Was it because Kenyatta sinned? No, was it because Ryan sinned? No, Jesus came because Adam sinned and the Bible says through one man, sin came into the world. Into the world. And so, it doesn't have to be everybody in your family. It doesn't have to be everybody in your political party. It doesn't have to be everybody in your country. It takes only one person to bring the judgment of God upon an entire land. Civilizations have been wiped out completely because of the sin of one family. Why is that important for us to know? We are not supposed to just look the other way when we see all of the immorality that is going on in the world. When we see the lack of consideration, when we see the spate of greed, when we see the, the godlessness that has come into our nations, we're not supposed to just look the other way. We are supposed to beg God for mercy because when his judgment comes, it comes overall. And the Bible says that when the judgment of God visited the earth, to find a man was, was easier than finding gold. But guess what? Because of all the technology, the convenience of technology, we have seemed to, forgot, to forget, or we seem to have forgotten that there is all of this evil that is going on in the world. Now let me, let me give you an, another example. There is something that is going on in the world, and even for a while, myself would notice and look the other way until the Holy Spirit drew my attention to it. And I'm like, no, I can't keep looking the other way. And it's this rate at which we're turning out billionaires. The rate at which the world is producing billionaires. And I just felt like, man, these guys, these boys are sharp. They're innovating. They're creating stuff. They need to make all those billions. And so I convinced myself and looked the other way until the Holy Spirit said to me, that is that the will of my father? And I'm like, oh. No, I don't think so. <laughs> because the Bible says an unjust weight is an abomination before the Lord. Now, there will always be poor people. Jesus said it. He says, you will have the poor amongst you always. But then, is there 
any righteousness in having some people continue to take advantage of the majority and still be praised for it. Don't worry if you don't know yet, you may know now, I am a strong advocate for the earth becoming a utopia. Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that in the thousand years of Jesus' reign, when he returns upon the earth, the sons of God will inherit the earth. We will take over everything and in righteousness we will rule. So when I see these things, now after the Holy Spirit had cautioned me, I have stopped looking the other way. I have started asking God, Father, how do we prepare to inherit the earth? You know, the Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And so it is our inheritance, but the wealthier some people get, the farther away from that inheritance the rest of us get. Simply because they keep buying up everything for themselves. Now it is no longer a secret that there are continent-sized lands that have been kept by certain families for hundreds of years. They wouldn't even let it appear on the map. And we're like, oh, I've seen everything on Google Earth. No, you haven't. No, because we were looking at one the other day. We saw an ancient map from 1587. And there were continent-sized lands. Remember Admiral Byrd of the United States Navy. When he came out on the news, was it 62 or 67 sometime around that time frame? He came out in the news and he said, we have found land that is bigger than North America. He died mysteriously shortly after saying that. Do you think that is a coincidence? But these boys were not even as wealthy as they are now. So now let's think about how many more stuff that they are taking away from us. But if you keep looking the other way, thinking it's none of your business and you're not asking for mercy, when the judgment of God comes, it will come upon all. You need the mercy of God. We need to cry for the mercy of God. And it is the duty of those people who are believers to do it. When you are a believer, what are you? You are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. You are kings and priests unto your God. When it comes to the mercy of God, even though the mercy of God is infinite and it is forever and it is abundant, look at what the Bible says in verse 3. The Bible says here in verse 3 of Psalms 118, the Bible says, Let the house of Aaron now say his mercy and deals forever. The house of Aaron has to say his mercy and deals forever. If we don't speak forth the mercy of God, the mercy of God is not going to materialize. This is where we need, this is why in particular for this season that we need to understand Psalms 103 verse 7. You see, because some people wonder, why do I have to say? Why do I have to ask for it if God is already, if he's overflowing in mercy? If he knows I need it, let him just give it to me. Well, if you were God, maybe that's the way you would design your own existence or, or design the world. But the one who created this existence and created the world, he has principles by which he operates. And one of those principles is that you ask to receive. And when it comes to the mercy of God, not just anybody asks for the mercy of God. It is the duty of the priest to ask for the mercy of God on behalf of others. Now let's go back to Psalms 103 verse 7 real quick and let me just bring out one or two more things. You see, Moses was shown the way of God. But the children of Israel, they were shown what? What did they see? They saw the works of God. God wants to deliver us in this season that we're in from undue restlessness, agitation, sorrow, fear, sadness, all those negative emotions. God wants to deliver us from those things. And the way that he has chosen to do it is to do it by insight and revelation. If you do not know the way of God and you only know the works of God, you can never truly be at peace. Because the way things are in this life are never, and I say that again, the way things are in this life are never like God said it should be. 
Look at the ministry of Jesus. When Jesus was here, what did people see? They saw the son of a carpenter who seems to have been able to work some magic. They didn't see him for who he was. Even the people that were in his company like Philip, they had been with Jesus. They were with Jesus for three and a half years and close to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Jesus was like, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And Philip was like, come on, stop joking. Show us the Father. And he was like, what else can I do? I am standing here, the fullness of the Godhead. So in the natural, things don't reflect fully the spiritual. Now let me tell you something before you, before you throw your theology out of the window. Eventually, it will line up. But the reason why it is never a full representation of heaven is because heaven is eternity, the earth is in time, and you cannot bring all of eternity, to, eternity into a particular point in time. Time cannot handle it. So if you are walking based on what has already been worked out, you will be missing out on the things that remain a mystery to your existence. I'll give you an example that many of us can relate with. You know, there are times wherein, Josephine, you feel infirmity in your body. You may be running a fever and you're thinking to yourself, but the word of God says, by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. That God's name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals me. What you are asking for is you're asking to see the works of God. Healing is one of the works of God. And so as long as you're waiting for the works to come to recognize or to appreciate who he is, there will always be a gap in your fulfillment. There will always be a gap in your joy. And that was why the children of Israel in the wilderness, they complained all the time. They complained all the time because all of what was coming out of the mouth of Moses, all of what they had read in scripture, never aligned with wherever they were at. He said that he would not allow their foot to dash against a stone. But here we are, all day long. Even us, we're kicking the stones on purpose because we're just frustrated. They complained all the time because of the fact that they were focused and fixated on the works of God. But Moses knew the way of God. Wouldn't you like to know the way of God? And I think we all should. What is the way of God? Jesus looked at his disciples when he saw that they were perplexed beyond reason. He said to them, don't look too far. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let me tell you something, folks. God in this season doesn't want you to remain a works of God knowing Christian only. He wants you to be a way of God knowing believer always. To know the way of God is to have a revelation into what the Word of God says. Because the Word of God is the way, the truth, and the life. The reason why Moses was not complaining like they were complaining was because not only would he hear God, but he would receive revelation and insight into what God wants to do. The moment I have that revelation of what the word of God says about me, my body may still be shaking with fever, but it's no longer going to rob me of my joy simply because I know that, you know what, whether now or a little later, I am going to recover from this illness. And if you don't get there first by the way of God, you can't fully receive it by the works of God. The Bible says in the book of 3 John, verse 2, that brethren, I wish above all things that you may be in health and prosper as your soul prospers. Your soul has to have that revelation with God in all things. When I say have a revelation with God, what I mean is that you need to be able to see from God's perspective. Because God can show you a revelation, but you're still busy looking at it from your perspective. And you know what happens to us every time we look at God's insight, what he's showing us from his word, from our perspective, we always have questions. Now you've graduated from complaining to now just confused. Remember what happened to, to, um, to um, what's his name, uh, Zechariah, 
when the angel of the Lord said that his wife was going to have a child and he knew that his wife was past the age of childbearing, right? Because the Bible says that Elizabeth was already past or post menopause. So she couldn't have children anymore. So Zachariah was like, mm, indeed, how will these things be? Now, Zachariah at that particular point in time had not seen the works of God. The birth of John the Baptist was the work of God. It was nothing but a miracle because the woman was past the age of childbearing. So it wasn't like he was struggling with the works because the works hadn't made, been made manifest. But God showed him his word. And the word would have become the way if only he would see it from God's perspective. But he stood there even though the word was in front of him and he was questioning the word of God. And so the angel of the Lord was like, man, dude, I'm busy. I ain't got time for you. We're not going to let you ruin this thing. So they shut him up. Because if you had allowed him to continue talking, he would have spoken doubt into everybody else. In fact, in particular, he would have said to people that the other day, I don't know, I, was, I thought I was in God's presence, but I was attacked by a demon who told me that my wife would be pregnant. And they said, but what if he was an angel? He would have said, no, there's no way he could have been an angel. He told me that we would name the child John. Come on. In our family, no one's ever been called John. He's, yeah, he says, no, there's no way. You see, because you know that Zechariah was, was a priest of the order of the enforcer. They were the ones who enforced order in the temple. So the guy was very legalistic, very strict-minded. Everything was the law or nothing. And God said his wife will have a child and they will call that child the grace of God. The guy was like, I can't handle this. It's not going to happen. So it is very critical for you to be able to receive insight with God, to be on his side by faith, to see what he is showing you. That's when the word of God becomes to you the truth, the way, and the life. Let me tell you something, folks. Quite often, the reason why we lose our joy and the reason why we're sorrowful is because we cannot see what God already has for us. And in order for you to be able to walk with God and walk in the way, you need to have light because the word of God is what? The lamp unto your feet and the light unto your path. But the word of God does not automatically come to you as light. That word of God usually comes to you as the life of God. The Bible says in him, John chapter 1 verse 4, which is the word of God that became flesh, was life. And that life was the light of man. So when light shines, that is the work of God. Because the Bible says, after God created the heavens and the earth, on the seventh day, he rested from all his works. What were his works? The beginning of his works was the light. He says, let there be light, and there was light. So quite often, many of us will be comfortable, happy, clappy, when the light is already shining. But the Lord is saying, are you happy to just make do with the life until it becomes light? Is your heart able to interact with God by faith until you see things materialize? This is the principle for existing in the last days as a believer. Why? Because in the last days, darkness covers the earth and grows darkness to people. So you need to know how to tap into the light of what is in the mind of God. I'm going to share with you three things very quickly of how to know the way of God. Things that Moses had to learn. Things that Moses had to commit himself to. Three things, just very quickly. Because when you walk out of here today, I don't want you to continue to live with any feeling of deprivation because it breaks the heart of God when us who are supposed to be his children pray as though we're missing something. We cry as though we are missing something. We, we speak like unbelievers. When people are talking about what's going on in the economy, are you joining them like, man, I am struggling, oh, this and that. How can you be struggling the one to whom he has given all things? When something is happening in the world, you're afraid like unbelievers. And Jesus says, that is not your portion. He says, you are in the light. He says, those who are in the light do not stumble. The children of Israel stumbled all the time because they were in darkness. That was why they kept complaining. Because they just could not see past the meal they just had. They just couldn't see what was in front of them. They were complaining and spitting on the rock that was containing the water that they were complaining for not having. 
let me tell you something. God does not want you to continue to be like that. And that is the reason why it is critical for you to graduate from waiting on the works of God to be fully made manifest before you start singing praises, before you start testifying of the goodness of God, before you start rejoicing and having peace that the world cannot take from you. Thing number one, I'm going to show that to you very quickly in Exodus chapter 14. And maybe this is the only one that we're going to go and look into the others and we'll just shout it out to you. So Exodus chapter 14, look at verse 7. If I let's read from verse 3, it's an interesting read. Exodus 14 verse 3. What does it say? It says, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Now, look at what happens in verse 14. Verse 14 says, Then the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Now, the world is betting against your flesh. The world system and Satan, Alan, they are betting against your flesh, your carnal self. The part of you that walks by sight. The part of you that waits until you see the works of God in manifestation before you believe. Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So guess what Pharaoh was doing? Pharaoh was telling his boys, he was like, don't worry, I know those people. They are all lazy bums. If we don't whip them, they don't work. We know that by the time they go into the wilderness, one or two days, they're already toast. Because we said they came out of here completely tired and busted. They've never come past Goshen. Now, how would they make it in the wilderness? We are the ones who give them garlic. We are the ones who give them on onions. If we don't give them, they don't have. So he says, by now, they will be bewildered. So let us go after them. But look at what the Bible says in verse 14. The Bible says God had already committed that he would fight for them. So when the enemy is betting against your strength that you do not have, God is already boasting of his strength that he is offering to you. Moses knew this. That was why he was not afraid. The children of Israel did not. That was why they said, Oh Moses, you have indeed brought us here that we may die. Look at the army. Because they were seeing the lack of the works. But Moses was already in the way of God. The way of God is the word of God. It's exactly what he has spoken concerning you. Is what he has committed to your heart. So guess what? If you would do that. So this is principle number one of how to know the way of God. To know the way of God is to know the will of God. Know exactly what the will of God is. What is the will of God for you? Example. Is the Bible says that though the young lions suffer hunger, the righteous is never forsaken. So it is not the will of God for me to be in lack or to be hungry. The young lions, they may go around on an empty stomach, even though they are the, 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 the hunters of hunters. What is God saying? God is saying, as long as you are depending on your strength and your ability, you will never tap into the fullness of my providence. So what do you do? As somebody who knows the way of God, you get to know what the will of God is. And if the will of God says this, I believe in it. Now, the second reason is you have to know the why of God. God's reason for doing things is very critical. If you don't know his reason for doing things, everything that is happening on the outside will always look like chaos. Do you know the number one question that people are asked who claim to have died gone to heaven, seen Jesus, and come back. People who have had out-of-body experiences. The number one question is, did you ask God why there is so much suffering on earth? People will always say that when they see Jesus, they will ask him, if you are such a good God, why is there so much suffering on earth? You know why that is the number one question that most people ask? Because most people are like the children of Israel who only knew the way, the, the works of God, they're looking at what they are seeing, but they don't know the reason why it exists. But the moment you know the why of God, the moment you know the reason in the mind of God, then guess what? It's no longer suffering. It becomes an opportunity. 
Oh, come on. It's no longer. Now, let me tell you what is it that you call suffering. That there are some children in some village somewhere. They have no water. They are in famine. They are skinny. Why is that meant to be considered suffering rather than an opportunity for you to be the light in the midst of that darkness? But when you know the why of God, what is the why of God? The Bible says that God has placed men under the sun that he may be exercised. And by so doing, he understands the reason of things and how they add up. The moment I know the why of God, when opportunities get taken from me, rather than crying and weeping and sorrowing, if I know the why of God, then what do I recognize? I recognize that the Lord is making me lighter because he wants to take me higher. Because those people who lived before me, whatever was taken from them, was taken from them not to deprive them, but to equip them to mount even higher. When Jesus was going to the cross, as it was getting closer and closer, 4,000 people were holding on to him and saying, we want you to become our king. We don't want you to go anywhere because he gives them free bread and fish. But they would have been too much of a burden because he needed to rise and go to Golgotha. God will strip things off of you because he wants to take you higher. But if you don't know why in the mind of God, everything will look like it's against you. The next thing that Moses knew that the children of Israel did not know is he knew the when of God. You need to know the timing of God. You need to know what? You need to know the when of God. The Bible says God reserves the right to make everything beautiful. But it needs time. So when you only focus on the works of God, guess what? You will look at the caterpillar all day long and just complain about how ugly it is. You're like, God promised me beauty for ashes. When I was in the world, I know that I had ashes. But now I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm supposed to have beauty. But this is the thing that I have. Is this, is this it, God? Many believers today, or many Christians, I should say, they feel scammed because they feel like they're not getting all of what was promised in the Word of God. And that is because they do not know the when of God. You're looking at that caterpillar and it looks very ugly. But if you can travel in time to the, to the butterfly that it will become, guess what? They're going to be like, ah, oh, now I see what you're doing. When the children of Israel were going through the wilderness and they had to be thirsty, they didn't know that God was detoxing them from all the poison they ate while they were in Egypt. They thought that God was depriving them. But if only they knew that a time was coming around the corner wherein they would be bathing in milk and stepping on butter. That, yeah, that was the Bible says God was sending them to a land that was flowing with milk and honey. Do you think they would have complained as bitterly as they complained? When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the pain of the betrayal was eating him up from the inside. He knew one of his own, one of his closest bodies was had just taken money to betray him. He knew that. And the ones who were supposed to be interceding along with him were sleeping like lazy dogs. Betrayed, abandoned by everybody. Even his own siblings were nowhere to be found. Do you know that when Jesus was being crucified, his close family did not show up but his mother. And that was the reason why he committed the care of his mother to John the Beloved. The, Joseph was not there. James was not there. The, the lady, what's, this, what's Jesus' sister's name? Salome. Salome was not there. And so Jesus looked around and even his own mother was abandoned. And he was like, well, I have no choice at this particular point in time. Being a Jewish man, he was responsible for his parents in their old age. But he never got to be of old age. So he said, let me tell you something. When this thing hit me, you know that the wisdom of God is, is deeper than what we can comprehend. Jesus already told everybody that they will die and mostly by crucifixion. He said, but you see this one. This one that is always following me and, pull, and pulling my shirt. He says, the disciple, this was John, of course, he was writing about himself, and he says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He said, what if I say to you that this one will not see death until I come? Jesus handed his mother to someone that he knew was going to live long. I just thought I'd throw that in there. 
And that is how God calculates. The God that thinks like that, you think is going to leave you hanging? No, that's not what he does. But when Jesus was in the garden, the reason why he was able to continue to pray was because the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus knew the when of the Father. He knew that it's only three days time and all of this is going to be over. Sin and the punishment that has plagued my brethren, my creation for 4,000 years is about to be sentenced. Judgment was coming upon the accuser. He knew, Jesus knew that in a couple of hours, the demons in hell, they will gather all of their cohorts from the corners of the universe to come and ridicule Jesus in hell. Jesus already knew that his strategy was going to work. And he knew that it was only a few hours away. And in three days, he was going to rise from the dead to be glorified forever and be made the head of principalities and powers. Because he knew that the word of God, guess what? He spoke no guile. He spoke no evil thing out of his mouth. The reason why you, are, you and I are always saying, oh God, do you not care that I perish? It's because you don't know that you're almost at the other side. The reason why some of us will pray and when we're praying, we're not really pray praying. We're using religious mindset to complain to God. It's because we do not know the when. We do not know when a miracle was actually going to fully drop. You and I, we've been in those situations. You know yourselves. We know those times that we have complained and the next day God did it. You know, but we're always too happy to go back and say, God, I'm sorry. I could have just waited one day. You see what I mean? And so what do you do? To know the way of God, you need to know the will of God. You need to know the why of God and you need to know the when of God. The will of God is that which has already been written. The why of God is that purpose that is in his mind that is gl more glorious than whatever reasons you may have given yourself. And then the when of God is the divine timing that his blessing that is already settled for you in heaven is downloaded to the earth when you need it in time. The moment you know these things, you're on fire. You are unstoppable. So allow me to take 90 seconds to relate this insight to the mercy of God. If you know the will of God, then you know that the will of God is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what is the will of God that was done in heaven already? In heaven, Satan rebelled against God and was driven out with his angels. And the Bible says that after Michael drove them out, they turned around and fought back and there was war in the heavens, right? Satan was kicked down to the earth and the Bible says war unto the inhabitants of the earth because the accuser of the brethren, that dragon and ancient serpent has fallen to the earth. So if the will of God that was done in heaven was that Satan was kicked out by Michael, who is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ because his name means like God, Mike L. If Michael kicked them out and they fought back, then when Jesus kicked them out, when he went deep down into hell, the Bible says, having gone deep down into hell, he spoiled principalities and powers and made an open show of them in it. Do you think they will not fight back? And they are fighting back right now. Enoch prophesied it. He says they would wait until the end of days and they would fight back. And if there was war in the heavenlies when they fought back, there will be war on the earth. And it's going to be messy. It's going to be chaotic. And they are betting on your weakness. They look at you, believers, Christians, and they see that you're tired. You're already drunk with the deception of the world. Your expectation is in what the government can do over what God can do. Your comfort is in what technology can bring over what the Holy Spirit can bring. And so they are betting on your weakness like Pharaoh was betting on the tiredness of the children of Israel. It has come full circle and we are at that point again and every single time we come to that particular point we need the mercy of God because the Bible says that it is only by the mercy of God that we are not consumed. So put things in perspective and hit, on, and, and hit your knees and begin to ask God for mercy. Don't ask God for money because I tell you, you know, I've been hammering the money a lot lately. I have seen it. The Bible says a false witness is an abomination to God. 
but the one who hears will speak expressly. I have heard it, I have seen it, money is going away. Money as you know it is a shadow of itself. I'm not saying this so that you can be afraid and start looking for what else, what are you going to do? Do I buy crypto? Do I buy gold? No, don't buy anything until you have first, first of all sought the Lord because what you need might not be what I need. You understand what I'm saying? And so don't ask God for money. Ask Him for wisdom on how to engage His mercy. Because mercy is the only thing that will keep you from being consumed. You see, let me explain this to you. I know that there are some preppers in the room, some people who have taken their time to study the revelation about the end of ages. But there might be people who have not taken so much time to look at it. So let me tell you something that will happen before the Lord Jesus comes. The Bible says that the kings of the earth and this is perhaps one of two times that the word elite appeared in the Bible. The Bible says the kings of the earth and the elite, they will make for themselves. Excuse me. They will make for themselves abodes in the hole of the ground, which you call a bunker today. The Bible says they will make for themselves holes in the ground, holes in the mountains against the great day of the Lord. The Bible says they will make an abode for both them and their servants and some other men. The reason why the Bible says some other men is so that you can know that you could be one of those people that is hiding under the covering of one corporation or the other. Or maybe you work for the government or you're sitting on intellectual property or you filed a patent. You know people who filed patents? There's this confidence that they have that when the world is ending or a great disaster is coming, the government will look at the list of people that are innovators and they will take them to somewhere in the mountains in the Midwest to secure them. If you don't know that, begin to observe your friends who have filed patents and people sitting on intellectual property or people who do special services for the government. There is a degree of cockiness that you may not have noticed if you do not know. So if you don't know, you could fall into that category wherein subconsciously your heart is not trusting in God but your heart is trusting in the government that will save you. That's why, in fact, I had to ask the Holy Spirit. I said, wait a minute, you listed everybody. You said the kings of the earth, the elite, their servants. What about these other men? He says, I left that on purpose so that nobody will think that they are above temptation. Okay, the Bible says, let him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. Yesterday while I was praying online, what did I say? I said the reason why the disciples were invited by Jesus to pray was not because Jesus could not pray on his own. Before the Garden of Gethsemane, did he invite them to come and pray? In fact, when he took Peter, James, and John to the mountain where he was going to pray, he left them somewhere halfway on the mountain. Because those boys did not have the kind of stamina for the way Jesus prays. You know that the Bible says that Jesus would pray fervently and earnestly. The Lord Jesus, if Jesus had to pray fervently, my friend, you need to grow. You, did you hear what I just said? It is in the book of Hebrews that our high priest, he fervently seeks the Lord on our behalf. When Jesus prays, Jesus doesn't pray like, Father, you know, I know we're cool like that. No. Jesus prays fervently. The Bible says in the book of James that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous is what brings results. I said it yesterday, I will say it again today. My wife and I, we don't pray loud and fervently as we do because we're Nigerians. People are like, oh, that's how Nigerians pray. Africans, everything has to be. When they're brushing their teeth, it's like that. When they're running, it's like that. So when they're praying, it's going to be like that. No, we're praying like that because it is what the word of God says. The Bible says the righteous has to pray with fervency. It's there. James. So Jesus did not take them with him because they could not operate at this level. So he didn't need them. Elizabeth, we don't even have to guess the reason why Jesus asked them to pray because he told them. He says, pray so that you don't fall into temptation. You're praying for yourself so that you don't fall into temptation. So here is the deal. After the elite and the kings of the earth made for themselves bunkers in the hole of the ground, against the great day of the Lord. What happened? The Bible says that when that great day of the Lord and the judgment of God was raining down upon the earth,
serious. I'm using the word raining again so that you know this is serious business. It comes upon everybody unless you're covered by the mercy of God. The Bible says that when that great day of the Lord came, they begged the Lord fervently that the rocks would fall on them and end their misery. They were begging God, say, God, let these let this rocks fall on us. What they thought was going to be their safety net became their coffins. Only God can save. And the only way that he will save us in these last days is by his mercy. You know what, what, what Solomon, what David said, and I've taught you here before. When David speaks, David was a flaming prophet, but he was a poetic prophet. So sometimes you don't even know his prophet's name. He says, I am Jacob, the generation of those who seek the Lord. I will not be consumed. What is Jacob? Jacob is the one that came after that will experience the former and the latter glory because Jacob retained his blessing even though he took the blessing of Esau as well. So when he said, I am Jacob, he was saying, I am of the last generation. I will not be consumed. But how will I not be consumed? He said, by the mercy of God. So we need to pray the prayer of mercy. Please, I'm telling you again, stop begging God for money. Stop begging God for a new job. Beg God for mercy. The Bible says the house of Aaron said, let there be mercy. Who, are, who is the house of Aaron? You and me. Aaron was the first priest of the nation of Israel. And when he was appointed, God told Moses, he says, when you pray for Aaron, God told him on this particular day, you will dress him up, make him look like this, and then sew the same uniform for his children. He said, because it will be a memorial unto my people that from generation to generation, his lineage will serve in my courts. And so if Aaron the high priest was told to beg for mercy, together with his house, then when Jesus is before the Father right now as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek asking for mercy, what should you and I who are of his household, what should we be doing? We should be asking for mercy because that is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is asking for mercy on our behalf and the saints that have already gone ahead of us, where are they? The Bible says that they are underneath the altar in the presence of God and they're burning incense. And what are they doing? They're saying, Lord, how much longer will it be before you avenge us on our enemies? And let me tell you something. I, did, I don't have time today to explain it, but the video is made available online so you can go on our YouTube um, or Facebook and you will get it. So let me tell you what I said yesterday briefly. The reason why you ask for mercy and the reason why you burn the incense of mercy is because the timing of the fulfillment of our salvation is dependent on how much we can ask for mercy. Because if we don't speak, God does not remember. Oh, someone is like, oh, God, is, God does not have amnesia. No. The children of Israel, they spent 30 extra years in Egypt because they waited until the time had come. Because they were, they were good at following prophecy, particularly the sons of Issachar. They knew the signs of the time. When it was time for them to leave Egypt was when they started calling on God and it took 30 years of intercession. The Bible says after 30 years of crying before the Lord, the Lord looked from his holy habitation and he says, now I remember my people Israel. And it's like, oh my God, you could have remembered them after three days, 34 years. Why? Like I told you, on the earth, the way things happen can never be like the way God has already intended it because it takes time for earth to match eternity. So that is the reason why you can't wait until everything crumbles around you. Don't wait until they announce. Uh, let's not go into all of those things. But I'm just saying, okay? Don't wait until everything starts falling, until the stars of the heavens starts falling, until the great day of the Lord when the mountains are moving and collapsing. Don't wait until all the fish in the sea are dead before you start to pray for mercy. Pray for mercy now, buy time for yourself. This recommendation was a recommendation that took the apostles a while after Jesus left for them to recognize that, wait a minute, we need the mercy of God to buy the time because the days are evil. The Bible says buying up the time because the days are evil. So what does that mean? The days, the evil day is coming. Buy yourself time today and ask God for mercy. I wish I had more time to tell us more stuff, but I'm gonna just read to us from 2 Corinthians chapter seven and then we're gonna close out the meeting. Alan, did we all get the communion just yet? Alrighty. So one special thing that I want us to do today is this. You know, in the last couple of weeks, we have been really big on deliverances. 
to be delivered from fear, from slumber, from confusion, from drunkenness. Why is that? So that we can wake up and pray, right? Because if we get delivered and we don't know how to be filled, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, that those demons that we're delivered of will go and find seven stronger demons and they will come and occupy the place because they will find it clean and ready again for their occupation. So as the Lord is delivering us from worry, as he's delivering us from fear, as God is delivering some of us from over-dependence on government and organizations and money, Isaiah 45 is the prophecy, is the prophecy to the church. And it says one of the biggest destruction of God's people is that they will trust in money that cannot save. Okay, so a lot of us have been delivered. We think too much in money. We think too much in what the Lord says. We think too much in all these things rather than depending on the mercy of God. Now, as God is delivering us from those things, we need to engage him to fill us with new things. And you get that in the place of intimacy with him. And intimacy looks like prayer. Do you understand what I mean? You see, this thing is coming around full cycle. So if you have not been here for a while, I'm encouraging you. Maya, I'm encouraging you. Go and listen to the last couple of messages because they all tied together. Alrighty? Because, let me tell you something, there is a reason why God brought you here. I'm not the most entertaining preacher in the world. Sometimes I even forget that I can be funny. Just because I'm too serious about what I am saying. But God will bring you here because he wants you to know these things. And now that you know, what will you do about it? Are you just going to add it to your shelf of messages that you have heard or warnings that you have received? Or will you begin to ask, act on it and say, Father, I'm going to ask you, how do I get closer to you? You have invited me to come. What do I need? How do I present myself? And then if you ask him, because he is your Mordecai, he will tell you. And then after he's told you, what do you do? You do what he says with the wisdom of his will, of his where, of his why, and of his when. But now, this is what I want to show you. So as we break bread today, I want you to start to open your heart. You see, the power that is in breaking bread together is what you need to see more clearly. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now let us read from verse 17. I mean, no, not 17, from verse 7. 2 Corinthians 7, 7. He says, And not only by his coming. Now, let's read verse 6. Says, Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. This was Paul addressing the Corinthians. But the Bible says all scripture was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to the church. The Lord wants to see you show zeal. When you are zealous for the things of God, God rejoices over you. What did I tell you at the beginning? I told you at the beginning that God has joy for us miraculous joy, supernatural joy. Laura, I'm talking about the kind of joy that just make you smile in the face of the storm. When people are planning to come and annoy you, the Lord already prepares your heart so when they come and they start doing their acrobats, you're just smiling. Simply because you have become like Mount Zion that is not easily moved. When some people within the economy are planning to add more billions to their billion and they want you to be at a disadvantage for it, if they have to lock you in your home for months to do it, they don't mind because they've already done it. You understand what I mean? You see, I tell people, if you cannot follow the spirit, follow the money. At least when we saw the way the money flowed while we were locked at home, then we know that, okay, maybe there's some hanky-panky going on in here. So no matter what they need to do, while they are yet plotting it, the Lord can make it null and void over your life if you have his joy. Because that joy is strength. So how do you get that joy? When God starts to rejoice over you, that is how you get joy because his joy will flow to you. Whatever God does not create does not exist. You understand what I mean? The Bible says in 
John chapter 1 verse 3 that there was nothing made that was made without him and so if you want joy it has to come from him and how is joy how does God joy flow from him to you because he rejoices over you so how do you get him to rejoice over you let him see the zeal that you have for him he says I have seen your groaning I have seen your zeal and I rejoice over you so folks pray with much zeal seek God earnestly and he will begin to rejoice over you and that is going to set you free I have seven dynamic prophecies today but we're going to break bread so if we can just all rise to our feet because as we live here today you know on Tuesday we had seven prayers but today we have seven prophecies and we're going to we're going to have the body of Jesus and then I'm going to prophesy and then we're going to have his blood for those of you who are new to communion house welcome thank you for joining us I don't want you to be afraid when I say we're going to eat the body of Jesus and drink his blood we're only saying what Jesus himself said you know because the first time Jesus said oh unless you eat the body of the son of man and drink his blood you have no part in him he said that at a meeting that the Bible recorded to have 4,000 men not counting the women and children 4,000 men not counting the women and children and the moment Jesus said you will eat my flesh and drink my blood the, the church was reduced to 12 people the Bible says that they all deserted him because they're like man what kind of cannibal spirit is this they were binding Jesus in Jesus name Y'all don't know the meaning of what I just did. Even I don't know either, but I know my wife does it. I think that means over my, over my head or something. Oh yeah. So, let me tell you something. They, were, they, they, were, they didn't understand what they had just heard. And so, I don't want you to be one of those people that would desert Jesus because you did not understand what I just said. When they left and the day came, he said to the 12 people who stayed with him, he says, you see this bread? And mine had just flown away. Was it five seconds just yet? Okay, it's more than five seconds. If y'all weren't watching, I would have eaten it still. Because the Bible says, if Alan, can you catch? The Bible says, if I by any means eat poison, it will not hurt me. So it's not for me, I did it for you. I don't want to gross you out. So Jesus took the bread, and you know what he said? He says this. Let's do it together. If I can open this thing. Finally. He said, this is my body that was broken for you. And so let me tell you something. That is the reason why we say it. We say it because it, Jesus said it was his body. You see, the power of life and death are in the tongue. All things were made by the word. He said it and it became his body. And he took the cup of wine and he said the same thing. And that also became what he had promised. So today as well partaking of the body of Jesus and getting ready to drink his blood. We do so in remembrance of him. We do so boldly because we know that there is power in that mystery. And when himself broke bread after his resurrection with the disciples that were confused about his person, the Bible says the moment he gave them the bread and the wine, the moment he broke bread with them, their eyes were opened, they saw him and then they saw him no more. The reason why they saw him at first, you know, Jesus says, if you don't have a part, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have a part in me. So the moment they saw him, the reason why they saw him was because that was on their way to going inside of him. You can only see what you're outside of. Okay? Can you see this building now as you're standing here from outside? What's the color of this building now? No, you can't, yeah, unless you memorized it before you came in. So from the outside, you can see the building, but once you're in it, you no longer see the outside. So they saw Jesus on the outside for a moment because he was absorbing them into himself. The power of this mystery is that the word of God can become life to you, can become truth to you, can become the way for you if you are in him. So today, I want you to say, as I'm eating of the body of the Lord Jesus, this is prophecy word number one. As I am eating of the body of the Lord Jesus, my eyes will open to see him as the way, the truth, 
and the life. In Jesus name, you may eat of the Lord's body. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to tell you in a little while the reason why we're breaking bread first, taking prophecies and then drinking the blood later. So second prophecy is this. The Lord said to me, he says, this thing has plagued a lot of my people. He says, they did not sync up the timing of their heart with my clock. Because, you know, we were aliens to the commonwealth of Israel. We were of a nation that is called the nation of the world, Babylon, that was perishing. And the Bible says he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. It is just like when we came here from the UK and we were coming from a clock that was five hours ahead. Imagine if we got to America, Elizabeth, Barbara, if we didn't sync up our clocks with that of America, we would always complain. We will become impatient. We will feel like we have missed everything. We will get there before nothing is ready because we're running on a different clock. And so some of us, when we became translated into the kingdom of God's dear son, we did not sync up our timing with his. And that is the reason why we're agitated, confused, and then we miss pretty much everything that God is doing. That was the last challenge that God had to help Jacob overcome before he came into the fulfillment of promise. He woke up and he was like, oops, the Lord was here and I knew it not. He woke up too late. Whereas Solomon was in his sleep and God passed by his window and he grabbed his attention. The timing has to be correct. So Antoine, this prophecy is not a prayer. You know, on Tuesday we prayed. But now I'm telling you it's a prophecy. I'm telling you what God is doing for you and I today because we showed up. He is syncing up our hearts with his. And if I were you, I would say, thank you, Lord. I will bless him because even though his way is higher than my way, he is syncing me up with his divine timing in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something to look forward to. In fact, because it's not nine o'clock yet, I'll tell you three. Two things to, three things to look forward to. The moment your timing sinks with God, you will have favor with men. People will start to favor you. You see, because favor is a fragrance. And most fragrances are very subliminal. No, 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 subliminal is not what, they're very volatile. They vaporize very quickly. So if you get to the place of favor too early, no favor. Too late, no favor. But when you get there right on time, how many people have experienced that? When they tell you that this application has closed, but when you get there, there is somebody there that can do something about it. And they're like, man, if you had come five minutes earlier, they would have turned you back. And if you had come five minutes later, I wouldn't be here, but I'm here. It's your lucky day. You know what I always say when they say it's your lucky day? I say, thank you. But in my mind, I'm like, no, nope, it's the day the Lord has made. Number one, once your clock sinks. Now, I'm telling you this because I want you to have a guarantee that indeed you have met with the Lord today. You will start to see favor. Now, the next thing that you will start to see is this. Your dreams will not start having meaning to you. Guys, we're nearly done, okay? Your dreams will start having meaning to you. Look at Joseph when he was 13 years behind or 17 years behind God's timing. His dream did not make any sense to him. But the moment he was close to standing before Pharaoh, some boys were in the prison and they were having dreams. <laughs> and he was like, what is, what is going on here? This is the meaning of your dream. This is the meaning of your dream. And Jake, Joseph never begged anybody. But when the time came, he didn't have to beg. He declared, he said to the man, remember me when you get to where you're going because he recognized that it was time for him to get out from where and exactly what he said was what happened the men got into the place when Joseph was needed and he says I remember my fault this day let me tell you something the favor of God is upon you because your clock is being synced with his and now your dreams will start to make sense I said I'm going to give you three so I'm going to give you just one more you know the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come and they were together in one place and in one accord. There was a sound that came from heaven and it was as a rushing mighty wind and the Holy Spirit filled all of them. When your timing is synced with that of God, you will have power. 
power to cast out dev the devils, power to make peace, power to raise up the sick from their beds and the dead. Because now you are plugged in while God's power for that situation is active. You see, God is doing a great thing among us. And tell the people that were not here that the reason why the devil took advantage of them was because they didn't know how serious this meeting was going to be. But sometimes you don't know. That's why you just show up. Because you just never know when the angel of the Lord is going to come and stir up the water. So prophecy number three, very quickly. Have I given you two prophecies already? Prophecy number three. I'm going to combine three and four. You see, the Bible says the Lord is the glory and the lifter of your head. As you have come in here today, you will begin to experience the glory of God. What is the glory of God? Let me explain to you what the glory of God is real quickly. You see, God is light and light moves very fast. But when the light of God casts an image, that is the glory of God. The glory of God is everything God wants to tell you painted with the brush of light. So you begin to have insight into exactly how God sees you because when you recognize that the way God sees you, he sees you in glory form. That's why the Bible says that we are being changed into that same image and we'll go from one level of glory to another level of glory. Someone says, but why do I need to have a revelation of the glory of God? Because the Bible says God is the glory and the lifter of your head. If you don't see that you are his glory, you will not rise even though he's trying to lift you. You will see his glory and you will arise. The Bible says, arise, shine, for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. If you don't understand that, just said, I'll give you an example. The example that I will give to you is that you are in a marriage relationship and that marriage is turbulent and you do not know where the problem is. The Lord will open your eyes to see how you need to be in that marriage for there to be peace. And the moment he shows it to you, you will rise up. You will rise up from malice. You will rise up from complaining. You will rise up from, you didn't even know that you were always, what's the word, nagging. But now you will rise up from it. You didn't even know that you were always failing to do what you're supposed to do. But when you see yourself the way God sees you, you will never want to be that other person anymore. Because it's like, man, I don't want to be this guy. This guy's been losing and wasting the resources of heaven. I want to be this one that brings peace upon the earth. When you see glory, you rise. Arise, shine. Why? For the glory is risen upon you. When you see yourself as God sees you, you will rise. No one has to beg you to rise. <laughs> uh, the reason why you don't preach at work is because you don't see yourself as you are. You see yourself as somebody that they can shut down. But the moment you see yourself as the voice of him crying in the wilderness, proclaiming the preparation for the return of the Lord, you will speak. You will rise. So that is three and four. Number five is a very interesting one, and I love it. You see, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, <laughs> the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, it says, with the same measure with which you measure, because that's why the Bible says, judge not, that you may not be judged. He says, with the same measure that you measure, it will be measured back to you. So I prophesy over you today that gone are the days of you seeking God and not finding him. Now, every time you draw close to him, he will measure back to you the same way by drawing close to you. When you seek him, you will find him. The Lord is about to measure back to you as you measure to him. So when you spend time in his presence, he will spend time with you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Because it is time for your comfort, O Zion. It is time for your delivery, O Israel. It is time for your comfort, you inhabitants of praise. It is time. It is time. Praise the Lord. Number six is this. I prophesy over you that in the mighty name of Jesus, you would allow yourself to reduce and for God to increase. Because the Bible says, I must decrease so that he might increase. But many of us, we love the old self that we have always been so much. The way you do things, you're so married to yourself that you don't want yourself to step out of the way for the Lord to be seen in you. Every time someone says a thing, you're like, I've got the right answer for what you just said. But the Lord is saying, calm down. You are the reason why they have not been able to hear me concerning you because you have the right answer. Every time you want to talk back, the Lord is saying, hold your peace and I will fight for you. So allow yourself to reduce. It's not a prayer. Remember, it is a prophetic declaration over you. The Lord has given to you as a gift. 
I sought the Lord. I was thinking about this. It wasn't like a serious seeking the Lord. So I was just thinking, I said, Lord, those seven things you asked us to pray about. When we prayed, you also told us to speak against restlessness because we have to be rested in you to receive. And he said, yes, I need you to be rested. He said, but the reason why some people can't be rested is because they do not have a personal example of somebody who rests. Your father worked all the time. Your mother worked all the time. And I'm not talking about having the responsibility of going to work to serve other people. But I'm talking about the fact that their wheels are always spinning. They think they have to solve all of their own problems. And the Lord is saying, I will be your example. So the Lord is saying, I was the first person to rest. And I would now allow them to see me so that they can rest and still be effective. To rest in him means to let go of every worry and every care. So I prophesy to you that this season will be your season of divine rest in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, the reason why the Lord would have me first of all go through the seven prophecies after we've eaten the bread, before we drink the blood, is because, you see, when Jesus went to the cross, before his blood was shed, his body was beaten and broken. And the Bible says that the chastisement of our peace was placed upon him. You see, every one of those things that I prophesied over you were things that were taken care of because Jesus died, because his body was broken. And so now, when you begin to walk in those things, when you begin to see his example and you go to rest, when you begin to walk in those things to see his glory and arise, allow yourself to rise, you know what's going to happen? You will start to live a different life. And that was what Paul was saying. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. For this life which I now live is the glorified life of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And what is the life of God? The blood of the Lamb. The Bible says the life of an animal is in his blood. As you drink the blood of Jesus today, you say to yourself, I am doing this in remembrance of him. I am ready to live the glorified life of the Son of Man who loved me and gave himself for me. Now you may open up and you may drink in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Let's be seated. But as you're sitting down, I want you to pray. I want you to pray. In fact, I want you to say this very quickly. It's only going to take a minute. Laura, stay for this one. I want you to say this. I have heard the word. I will do the word. So help me God. When you say so help me God, you're not just saying it because it's a pledge. You're saying it as a plea to say, God, please help me. I have heard your word and I want to do it. So help me. I'm going to go through a couple of announcements here. But while I'm, before I do that, uh, our communion house offering is part of our worship. The Bible says, honor the Lord your God with your substance and with the first fruit of your increase. And so I want to encourage you today, we are not raising, we do not raise offerings at communion house for projects or to pay bills. We raise offerings or we receive offerings as a form of worship before the Lord. So don't feel under obligation to give. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. So let everyone give as he has proposed in his heart. Not grudgingly, not of necessity. Because God loves a cheerful giver. Package your offering as a gift, as an appreciation, as an offering before the Lord. And as you are doing that, I'm actually going to do that also. But um, there is this scripture. When I look here, I see it. When I look there, I see it. So I think we have to read it. It's Isaiah chapter 7. Don't worry, I'll just read it to you. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 17. And I pray that the, you will be able to apply the coded message in Isaiah 7, 17 this week in the mighty name of Jesus. And this is what it says. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house. Days that have not come since the days that Ephraim departed from Judah. Now, verse 19 says, They will come and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rocks and on the thorns and on all thorns in the pasture. You see, the Lord is saying to you that even though they come 
He has rest for you. They may come from everywhere, but your heart will not be moved, your heart will not be afraid. So God is letting you know that he already knows that they're coming. Whatever it is that anybody's, any policy that anybody's formulating, any strategy that they're revolving, let me tell you something, the Lord knows. He already knows. And let that be the confidence of your heart in the mighty name of Jesus. Meditate more on that if you would when you get home. Isaiah 7, 17. The Lord knows that they are coming, but he is with you. So, let us bless the offerings. There is an offering basket. Where is it? It's just, yeah, it's right here. Uh, and then you can bring your offering into it or you can bring it after the service in the next one or two minutes. So let me quickly do mine too. Trust me, it's not that difficult. It's just because for some reason my phone was reconfigured so I didn't know where my app is. Alrighty. Okay, so if you have just given my phone or you have put an offering in the, in the basket, let us pray together and we'll just lift this up. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because you are the one that gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. Everything that we have, you've given to us. We only bring this as a token of worship, of thanksgiving, of appreciation, and of covenant. And so, Lord, let it all be received before you as a sweet-smelling offering in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And for this house that is receiving it, Lord, we are thankful, and we pray, Lord, that in the mighty name of Jesus, we will continue to see fruitfulness in this house, in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, so God is good. The only announcement that I'm going to stress today is, well, volunteers, 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 volunteers. If you want to volunteer for setting up or you just want to volunteer, I know that some people have indicated that they like to take pictures, they're good at it. Um, let somebody come up and relieve Brother Greg. He's been the key and principal photographer for us for a couple of weeks now, maybe even months. So my wife is sitting in the corner there by the TV um, so just find your way to her or Alan and let them know how you want to volunteer. But the announcement that I am stressing is this. This Tuesday, I want you to be prepared to come early so that we can start early because there are people, and I'm gonna tell you this very quickly, that God has delivered. I saw the chains taken off these people, but the marks that were left by the chains remain. And the Lord says, I want to rub over them a soothing balm, which is the balm of Gilead, to erase the marks that were left by the chains. There are certain experiences that God has delivered you from, but sometimes you still worry occasionally about those things. And that's because the scars are still there. Tuesday is not just deliverance, but Tuesday is a time of healing. And I don't want you to miss it. So make sure you come all in sundry. God bless you. We'll see you Tuesday. And um, yeah, online, this service of today is going to replay by 6 p.m. tomorrow. So if you want to watch it again and share it with your friends, that's when to do it. God bless you. See you soon.